Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 187 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at Ripple Energy and how they're democratizing renewable energy for the masses. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free to download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that in two weeks' time, we're chatting with a four time Guinness World Record holder about how he smashes efficiency records in an electric vehicle. John O'Groats to Land's End in a Ford Marquee with just a single charge stop? We'll find out how. Also, as a side note, in the following discussion with Sarah Merrick today, we had one or two technical difficulties with the recording, so you might hear variable sound quality across the interview. Apologies for that. Our main topic of discussion today is renewable energy. Not just renewable energy as a concept, but the whole idea of how you can benefit from renewable energy at home. Now, I was talking with my mother recently. Uh, She was saying she'd love to put solar panels on the roof, but because she's getting on in years, she's 82, she doesn't think she'll be able to get the return on investment on them before she passes. Now, I tactfully ignored asking her what the return on investment was on the new bathroom, new extension, new radiators, new interior layout, and all the painting and redecorating she did on the house a couple of years back. But she does bring up a more general point, which is that there are situations where some people might not be in a position, either financially or structurally, to do something like add solar panels to their roof. People who rent, for example. People who live in houses covered by listed building status. People who don't have a roof because they live in an apartment block. How are they supposed to gain from, say, solar panel installation? They shouldn't be excluded from the energy transition because of that. Which is why companies like Ripple Energy are a bit of a godsend for people like that. We'll talk a whole lot about Ripple shortly, but I'd like to welcome Sarah Merrick, who is the founder and CEO of Ripple Energy. Welcome, Sarah. Great to have you here. Tell me how you came to the world of electric vehicles and renewable energy. Yeah, so so I've always worked in the renewable energy industry. So right back, I started in 2000, uh, working, uh, you know, back then there was... I think wind and solar were less than kind of half a percent of the UK's electricity. There wasn't really any. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I've been working in it ever since then with a kind of focus on like regulation and lobbying and comms and, um, you know, but also wind's position in the electricity market is kind of my specialist subject, I guess. So let's talk then about Ripple Energy. What was the, dri- the driver behind starting it up? Yeah, so um, so I I was I chaired the industry's regulation strategy group, and as part of that, you know, this is back in probably twenty fourteen fifteen. The industry was looking at you know what happens in a post subsidy world. So you know subsidies are sort of coming to an end, and people were thinking, okay, how do I how do we carry on building out you know wind and getting more investment in wind if there aren't any subsidies, and the industry's response was kind of okay, let's sell our electricity to Google and Facebook in long-term, you know, corporate power purchase agreements. But by then, wind had become the cheapest source of electricity in the UK. And, you know, it just seemed wrong to me that, you know, if you are Google and Facebook, you know, a massive company, that was great. You could access the UK's cheapest source of electricity direct through one of these contracts. But actually me as an individual households I could and my only option was to put solar on my roof if I wanted you know my own source of green power so I just kind of ran the numbers and you know looked at how much of a wind turbine would I have to own to supply you know enough electricity to meet my um, electricity needs and it was you know such a tiny amount compared to um to putting solar on my roof and my roof wasn't even suitable so yeah I just thought right let, let's do it. Well, I kind of assumed somebody else was going to do it because it seemed so obvious. And then after a couple of years, nobody had sort of made any move to, to do it. So that's when I um, set up Ripple. Explain to the people who are listening who may not know the, the detail behind it. What is the proposition that you put to members of the, ch- the general public in terms of investing in a renewable energy project? 
Yeah, so 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 with energy, scale is really important. And big scale projects are so much cheaper than small scale projects. So that the kind of the core um the core concept is that it's so much cheaper to build one wind farm that can supply twenty thousand homes than it is to put, say, rooftop solar on twenty thousand homes, or you know, one big solar park that can produce electricity for twenty thousand homes compared to putting solar on 20,000 individual homes. So what we do is we set up a cooperative and then we gather together thousands of people and they each um, buy a tiny bit, how much they, they, they want within sort of various uh, limits. Um, they buy a bit of the wind farm or the solar park and then they get the electricity that their little share of the wind farm or solar park generates and that's supplied to their homes um, via the grid by our supply partner. So we're not a supplier and we, we don't develop projects. We enable individual households, thousands and thousands of households to come together and collectively own large scale assets and in return, get the low cost green electricity that they, um, that, that, that they generate. Clarify for me when you say owning, are they buying a share of the actual asset or are they buying shares in a company that owns the asset? They're buying shares in the cooperative that owns the wind farm, but 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 we um, equate it all back to individual watts. So you can buy as many individual watts. You can buy twenty five watts, fifty watts, fifteen hundred watts, however many you, you want, um, and then we convert that into shares in the um, in the co op, depending on how big the project is. Um, so, so, so so you're effectively buying watts of the wind farm, albeit um, it's via a cooperative. And are those What's sort of tradable in future? Can you say, oh, I no longer want to be a part of this or I want to buy more or, or what? How, how, excuse me, how does that work? Because it's a co-op, there are various um, uh, sort of rules about what we can do with the shares. So you can't sell your shares to somebody else, but you can withdraw your um, membership of the co-op. So if you, you know, after five years, you said, right, I don't want any part of this anymore, or I'm moving to America, I don't need any green electricity in the UK anymore. You can withdraw your membership and then you get back the value, the residual value of those shares. So the value of the shares obviously decreases over time because you know they're shared in an asset that is depreciating over time. So if, if for the sake of a wind farm, it would be if after five years, you had bought a thousand pounds of shares, you would get back about 750 pounds. Um, of your share capital back again. Now, the first project that you were involved with was, now I always get the pronunciation wrong in this, is it Gradfata? Great Gradfata, yeah. Wonderful. How surprised were you with the success of that? Yeah, we, we, we were, um, I think, pleasantly surprised. So, you know, we, we'd never done this before. Nobody had ever really done it before. Um, and so, you know, the nine mem 900 members of Great Gradfata, you know, they put their trust in us to do something that, you know, we said, this is what we're, we're, we're planning on doing. But yeah, they, they really sort of put their faith in us to, to do it, even though it hadn't actually been, been proven. We went away and, and, and we did what we said we, we were going to do. Um, you know, and those members of Greg Bader are now, like last year, they saved on average um, about £300 off their bill. They're set to save around £900 off their bills this year because prices have been so high. Yeah, it's just been really, really, really great that they've been able to, um, you know, they've been protected through the, this energy price crisis because they put their faith in us early on and, yeah, got, got involved in something completely new. So talk to me a little bit more about the, the cost reduction, because you've obviously mentioned there that because they're buying us the, the wattage to cover their, um, their usage, they're going to get a discount. And how, how is that worked out? Is it sort of a one for one basis or what? Well, so, so um, you know, if, if you own a thousand watts of the, of, of the wind farm, you basically get the electricity that your thousand watts generate each month. And so your electricity supplier, so for Greg Bather, it was most people were supplied by, by Octopus. So Octopus effectively buys your electricity from your wind farm instead of buying it um, from the market. And because you've bought your share of the wind farm and paid for its construction up front, the electricity, Octopus just buys the electricity at the wind farm's operating cost, which is about two pence a kilowatt hour, instead of the market price, which is, you know, at the moment it's more like 13, 14, 15 pence over the last couple of winters, it's been significantly more than that. So um, so instead of buying it at, say, 15p, they buy it at 2p and they pass the difference on to you. So if your bit of the wind farm generates 
whatever, I don't know, 100 kilowatt hours in, in a month. So you would get 100 multiplied by whatever that year's saving rate was. Last year, it was nine and a half pence. So if you're bit of the wind farm generated 100 kilowatt hours, you would have got, um, what was that, £9.60 off your electricity bill. This year, because the price has been so much higher, it's actually a saving of 27 pence a kilowatt hour. So if your bit of the wind farm generates one kilowatt hour, you get 27p off your electricity bill. And it's all fully proportional. You know, if you own 25 watts, you get exactly the same rate of saving as if you own, you know, 2,500 watts. So yeah, some members are making really, really significant savings off their bill. You know, obviously the more you own, the greater the amount of electricity that your share generates. So the more savings you get off your electricity bill. Now you've got two wind farms paid for. So there's one up and running and one still being constructed. And then you went on to solar. So what was the rationale for, for the move away from one type of renewable to another? So, so, so it's not really a move away from wind to solar. It, you know, we've always said that we would do any fuel-free technology that is, you know, proven and mature and low cost. And in the UK, wind and solar are the cheapest fuel-free sources. Well, they're the cheapest of any source of electricity, um, but, but, but they are low cost fuel-free sources of power. And and the fuel-free element is really important because um, if as soon as you introduce a fuel, you have fuel price risk. So, you know, you don't know what how much it's going to cost to run a gas station or even a, you know, grass or a um, biomass station because you don't know how much the cost of the biomass to fuel that station is going to be. Whereas wind and solar don't have any fuel. It's always been the plan that we would do a combination of wind and solar. It just happened that the first two projects were, were, were wind projects. The third one is solar. The fourth one might be another solar farm. It might be a wind farm. Um, so, so the plan is to just kind of just secure either a wind farm or a solar farm and, and, and launch those. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it depends on, you know, which projects are available, which ones can connect to the grid. There's so many different factors that, that, that we look at. So just to pick up on something that you, you said there, you talked about sort of picking up a project. So is this, it's a project that is already being or either mooted or in progress by a third party and you're coming in and offering to finance it or, or how does that work? Are you, are you going in and saying, we want to do this, we've got the money who's going to do it? What's, what's the- so we don't develop projects ourselves. We don't sort of go out and find a, you know, lovely windy field and try and get planning permission to put a wind farm on that field. De- you know, developers do that. Professional specialist developers do that. Once they've got planning consent, it's at that point, you know, lots of developers may then, you know, wish to sell projects to pension funds or big companies or utilities or infrastructure funds. It's at that point we say, actually, instead of selling that project to a pension fund or an infrastructure fund, you know, make it available, sell it, sell it to a cooperative and then Ripple manages all of the sales and purchase process. And then we manage all of the um, the share offer. So we, you know, the, the, the co-op does the share offer. We manage all of that. We've got our customer service team help people with any questions that they've got. So yeah, we don't go out and, and, and sort of find, you know, greenfield projects, albeit the, so, so we come in when a project is consented, but not yet built. And we then fund it by the co-op and then we manage its um, construction and operation. Do you get any say in the design of the project? No, mo- most of the designs of the projects have already been, you know, that that's subject to the planning consent. So in terms of, you know, how tall the turbines can be, normally where the grid route is, um, is, is to go is already, you know, determined at, at planning application. So there are, there are some, you know, final bits of really detailed design that that, that would be determined later on that, that we would... Um, Influence, but by and large, you know, there'll, there'll be, um, you know, we, we, we would um, speak to, you know, expert consultants on whether or not that, you know, where, where, where the roads should be on, on, on site and that sort of thing. Um, but, but yeah, so, so we don't tend to shape the project very much, you know, say, say, say Daryl, the, so, um, Daryl Water Soda Park, that already had a biodiversity management plan that had been approved by the council. So, you know, we then, we make sure that the co-op, um, you know, fulfills and, and builds the, the, the project as is set out in the planning um, condition. And in terms of the finances on a renewables project, do they work out, I'm going to use the phrase better or worse, and I'm not entirely sure what I mean by that. <laughs> yeah. Is it pref- more preferable financially to, to go for 
say wind, because I would imagine the capital costs for a, a wind farm are higher than solar, but you're going to get more usage out of a wind farm because it can go 24 seven in the right conditions. Whereas for example, solar, obviously it doesn't, you know, the sun doesn't sh shine at night. So it, is, is that sort of a consideration that, uh, that you would make when deciding on a project? Yeah, so 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 ultimately, we 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 look at you know how much is it going to cost for a, a, a household to buy enough of the project to cover it, you know, so, so that its share generates what what it needs, um, and and they're they're quite different technologies. So, for example, you know, a, a wind farm would last for twenty five years, you know, m m maybe thirty years, whereas a solar farm lasts for you know forty years. They have very different generation profiles across the years. So obviously, solar generates more in the summer, less in the winter. Wind tends to generate more in the winter, less in the summer. In terms of member savings, they still get all the savings throughout. You know, um, applied to their bills, you don't lose any any savings. Um, so yeah, they they're just kind of a bit different. So, so you you kind of look at what the capital cost is, and then you divide that capital cost over the operating life of the wind farm and sort of spread it out by almost by megawatt hour. So there's not a huge difference. That's called the levelized cost. There's not a massive difference between the two. And ultimately, lots of the project costs are very project specific. So it may be that you have, you know, you could have a quite low cost project that's got a very expensive grid connection, or you could have a very expensive project that's got a, a cheaper grid connection. So there are so many things, you know, it might be a wind farm, but it, you know, obviously would look for projects that have got um, that, that would generate the most electricity because they're in really windy locations. So there's there's a lot of different factors that you have to look at um, when determining, you know, wh whether or not we we um, take a project forward. So what's your actual business model? How do you make money on this? Yeah, so so um, we make our money by facilitating people to own these assets. So we charge um, an upfront arrangement fee and that's just a percentage of the capital cost. So it was part of, you buy your shares and then you pay us an arrangement fee, which is either um, five, six or 7%, depending on the project but, and whether you pay in one go or you pay over a number of different installments. And then we charge a management fee to the co-op. And so that is about £1.50 per megawatt, which is 0.15 pence a kilowatt hour. So it's not 15p a kilowatt hour, it's 0.15p. Um, the people don't pay that separately. It's kind of wrapped into the wind farm's operating costs um, and it's taken out before members get their get their savings. So they don't pay us any money sort of directly once, once the wind farm, you know, once they've bought their shares. So yeah, but, but, but we're you know, really super transparent about what, what, what we charge. Now this at the moment is UK based only because I believe you have to be a customer of a select group of UK based energy companies to actually take advantage of this. What are the plans for people living outside the UK? I mean, how, for example, could, uh, I know there are people who listen to this who have second homes in Spain. How, how could they take advantage of this? Yeah, so, so, so we would need to set up, and we're planning on expanding Ripple into other countries as well. Um, so, because you have to have a electricity supplier in the same market as the project and in the same market as the customer or the owner, so we, we have to have we have to kind of treat each market separately. You know, if you were in France, you we'd have to have a wind farm or solar park in France with a French electricity supplier as our partner, and then owners could live in France as well. So, so we kind of have to do it based on each electricity market. But, but, but we are definitely planning on expanding it beyond the UK. Let's move on a little bit. What, what aspects of the energy market have caused most issues for you as a company? For example, I've heard lots of talk about DNOs and how they're something of a bottleneck when it comes to connecting things like substations for charging hubs. So that's taking that electricity from the grid and, and, and moving it out. Are they being as helpful as they can be at the other end when it comes to move, pushing electricity into the grid? Yes, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I, I sort of having worked in the electricity market for so long, you know, I, I structured Ripple in a way that works within the current market and, and within the current market constraint. So, the, the, in, in terms of grid, there's been a lot of stories in the press recently about very, very long grid connections. And, and you know, we've spoken to developers who've got very, very long grid connections. And that's because when you develop a project, you then apply, you, you apply for an agreement to connect into the grid um, and you basically then form a queue. But the projects, because we don't develop new projects, the projects that we have been involved with have been, you know, they've been consented you know, a few years beforehand. So they've applied for, for grid capacity 
before this current bike in grid application. So we haven't, you know, our, our projects have been able to connect to the grid relatively easily. We had at Greg Rather, there was like a, a couple of months delay because um, you know, the turbines were up and then we just had to wait a little bit to get to get connected to the grid. But, you know, a couple of months is absolutely nothing compared to, um, you know, the, 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 the delays that, you know, if I was, if I was to apply for a new grid connection for a brand new project today, then you would be looking at, you know, you might be able to connect in 2035 or something crazy. But 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 no, our, our project, because they, they've sort of been in the queue for a while, uh, they, they haven't been um, particularly affected by the, by the delay. Is there any aspect of the energy market that might change and render some of the things that you're doing uh, moot? For example, we've heard discussions about possibility of splitting the price of wholesale uh, electricity from the decoupling it from the price of, of gas. If that does come into force, is that something that will be a benefit to you or a detriment to you? There's always changes happening in, in, in the electricity market. The things like, you know, the, the, the big, the need to decouple electricity prices from gas prices was sort of driven by, um, you know, it's been talked about for a a, a while, but it's all really come into focus um, with the gas price crisis that we've just gone through. Um, I mean, Ripple kind of does that already, um, and 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 lots of the um, you know, there's various different ideas being considered at the moment. But you know, ultimately, if it happens, it it would result in gas being paid a high price for its electricity, and you know, wind and solar potentially getting paid less than gas for the same kilo. For, you know, like for a kilowatt hour of, of electricity, which you know doesn't seem particularly politically acceptable. When you know normally in a market you would have the thing that people want, they would be prepared to pay more for, and the thing that people don't want has you know there's less demand for that. So it would kind of tip those market forces um, on their head, and it would it doesn't seem to me personally to be very particular um, sort of politically acceptable to do that. And another proposal is to. Um, Split up the electricity market into various different, either seven regions or, or uh, two or three hundred nodes, and have a different price in each region or node. And that, again, you know, from a sort of computer modelling perspective, sounds great. You can, you know, take off potentially re- re- reduce prices, but you know, ultimately, it would mean that if you're trying to plan a new wind farm or a new solar park or any other bit of infrastructure or electricity infrastructure, even for, for consumers. You don't know what price you're going to pay or receive for your electricity. And you, know, you don't know at the moment, but at least there are forecasts which say, you know, across the great um, G- GB electricity market, the price forecast is X or Y. You'd have to get specific price forecasts for each individual no- zone or node. And, you know, it would be dependent on so many really micro issues. And it'd be very, very difficult to have lots of confidence in in those prices, which then just makes, you know, it makes it more risky to make an investment. So there's a lot of pushback on both of these issues within the industry. So whether or not they happen, or certainly whether or not they happen in the current sort of structure that are being considered is a massive unknown. So, so yeah. So there's always changes happening, um, and you know there, there are far bigger people than um, than than Ripple saying that these proposed changes don't necessarily um, make complete sense. So just to clarify for me, you, I think you mentioned it back at the beginning of our discussion. Do you sell the energy? You're selling two specific energy companies. Is that on like a contract for difference, or is that power purchase agreement, or what? How, what's the mechanism behind that? So there's a there's no there's no contract for difference. Um, there is a power purchase agreement. So basically, we have a power purchase agreement with each of our supply partners, and then they then pay one price to the wind farm, and they pay the difference between that and the sort of normal price to the owners of the wind farm. But it it, it you know it, it's the wind farm that sells the power. It's not Ripple. We we just manage it. Okay, that makes sense. Moving on, um, I heard one of your presentations at Fully Charged Live in Harrogate, and I know you have some thoughts about tidal energy. Is this ever something you could see ripple energy going into? Um, no, I don't think so. So, you know, like I said, we, 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 we plan to offer, you know, our, our whole mission is to make green energy ownership affordable and accessible for everyone. You know, tidal at the moment, is incredibly expensive, um, and my personal view is that, that that it is likely to stay very expensive for the foreseeable future. Because you know, again, it comes back to this scale point. You know, wind and solar 
have scaled massively. So, you know, all around the world, um, there are you know, gigawatts and gigawatts of solar, gigawatts and gigawatts of wind being developed and deployed every single year around the world. The fact that there are thousands and thousands of solar panels and wind turbine blade, wind turbine towers, wind turbine generators being manufactured means that you get massive efficiencies in this learning by doing effect where you just, you know, you make a blade over and over again, you get better and better at it and the cost comes down. It's come down massively for wind and solar because they've just you know, factories have just manufactured so many individual units, whereas with Tidal, you know, the design of a Tidal Stream um, technology is, you know, it, it's by necessity bespoke to that, you know, the, the, the seascape that, mm-hmm. that, that it's sitting in. You're not going to get the sort of scale globally. You know, the UK has actually got a large proportion of the world tidal resource but actually that's not a very good thing because it means the global resource isn't actually that big so you haven't got that potential for thousands and thousands of tidal projects to be built all around the world and then for you know a supply chain to build up to manufacture all the different parts of those tidal generators so in theory if they you know if, if the cost of tidal reduced by whatever 80, 90 percent, then, then we could, and it was mature and the technology risk was low, then we could consider, um, you know, offering it on, on the platform. But it's very, very difficult to see how the technology would get there. On the subject of the fully charged shows and similar, you, you always seem to have a presence there. How good a return on investment do you get from them? There's always people on the stands when I go past. Do you get a lot of signups there and then, or is it a case of handing out the information, answering the questions, and then letting them go away and come back later with a, a yes, no? Yeah, so, so, so we always have a really amazing reception at, at every single fully charged um, show, show that we've been to. And I think, you know, with, with Ripple, because people tend to be, um, you know, they tend to be spending, you know, a couple of thousand pounds with us. It's really important that people can see us in person, but that, you know, it's not, we, you know, that our whole customer journey, you can sign up, you know, without, you know, meeting anyone in person. You don't have to go to the shop and buy your bit of a wind farm or solar park, but just having these opportunities to meet people in person and, you know, particularly to, us, to have members. So these are people who, you know, they own bits of Greg Rather or Kirk Hill or Daryl now, you know, they want to come and see us and kind of, you know, Loads of people just thank us for what we're doing because they, they they love it so much. And just having the opportunity to come and see it is really, really important. So we do absolutely have people signing up on the day, but generally we like people to you know be able to go away, think about it, read the share off a document in full, um, you know, mull it over in their heads for, for a bit before they um make a decision. But yeah, we we obviously we get people, you know, signing up. Then, then in there, but in general, people like to, um, you know, which is absolutely perfectly reasonable, you know, to, to sort of think about it. But it's really important for us to, you know, it's such a key audience for 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 Ripple. You know, lots and lots of our members have got EV, they've got heat pumps, they've got solar already. Um, you know, we we are part of that mix, and so to to be at events like fully charged is really important. That's interesting because I was going to ask you what is a typical profile of someone who signs up because I, it, as I might have mentioned earlier, I've got the solar, I've got the heat pump, I've got the the battery and that. I intuitively, I'm thinking, well, I'm not necessarily somebody who would sign up for the services that you offer, but you've just said that, yes, you do have people with, for example, solar panels who will then come and sign up to to the offering. So do you have a typical profile for someone who signs up? Yes. Yeah, so about 40% of our members have got home solar already. So, so we've got, you know, compared to the general population, you know, lots of people have got EVs, lots have got home solar, lots have even got heat pumps. Yeah. So, so we're kind of, you know, we have the, the sort of early adopter energy, um, clean energy enthusiasts, whether that's, you know, via heat pumps, EVs or, or solar. That was very much our sort of early, you know, members of Greg Rather and, you know, Kirk Hill to, to a certain extent were very much the, you know, energy enthusiast. And we're starting now to sort of include sort of more um, sort of mainstream people that, you know, maybe Riffle is the first thing that they've done. Um, you know, we want to show them that 
you know, owning a bit of a wind farm is actually really easy and, you know, it feels great. And then, and then people start to look at, okay, I've done this. It's wonderful. What else can I do? So that's when they might start to look at an EV or they might start to look at heat pump or home solar. It may be the other way around. So it may be that they've already got an EV and then they're looking to, you know, how can I power my EV, EV with, um, you know, stable, low cost green, green electricity. So, yeah, I mean, there's not a kind of fixed uh, Ripple member. There's a really, really wide range, wide range of ages. Yeah, and, and particularly now people that, you know, haven't done anything, you know, green or they haven't made a big green purchase yet. But lots of people, Ripple, like I said, it's, it's, the, first, it's the first purchase that they, that they make. For others, it's kind of like the, a follow-on one. And then for others, it's kind of like the icing on the cake. So what is the plan going forward? You went... Wind farm offering, then you took a very small break, and then another wind farm offering, then I think even smaller break between the the, the projects. Then you've gone for a solar farm offering. Is there an intention to pretty much have some sort of public funding offering going on all the time? Or is there going to be some sort of internal bottleneck which limits how far you can go with this? So what we we won't have a share offer open all the time. But so what, what we do is we enable people to get on the waiting list. And then when we have a project ready, we then let people on the waiting list know. They can then buy into the buy, buy, buy the shares in that project. Then we start construction of that one. And then we, you know, build up the waiting list again and then open a project for people on, on the waiting list. So it's kind of, you know, the, the, the waiting list will be open most of the time, but not an actual project. It's more about, you know, because projects they take a while to go through all the, you know, you've got to secure them, you've got to do all the due diligence, do all the sort of, you know, be really confident that it's a, you know, good, good project before it, um, you know, the vast majority of projects we we don't, you know, think to take forward. So, so yeah, so, so there's a lot of work to, you know, to, to get the project to a point where we're ready to open a share offer for them. But we kind of have a sort of ongoing, you know, way of enabling people to, to join the waiting list. And also being on the waiting list means that we can then, you know, it gives us time to explain the model to people, how it works, so they can then get comfortable, they understand it before they then um, go ahead and, and, and purchase shares in the project. Tell me something about the company that people from the outside wouldn't expect to know. Something that if they found out, they'd go, oh, now that's interesting. Um, so we are, well, I mean, us as a, as a company, we're crowdfunded ourselves. So, you know, we crowdfund Wind Farm and Solar Park, but, you know, as a company, we are owned by nearly 4,000 individual investors. So, yeah, we, we are household owned effectively. And yeah, Kirk, Kirk Hill Wind Farm, which was our... Um, Last Wind Farm was the UK's largest ever equity share raise for anything in the UK's history. So, yeah, thirty million pounds that it, it it raised. That's probably not going to hold that um, title for much longer now, 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 now that we've got Daryl. But 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 yeah. So you know, we're showing that co-ops. You know, people can sort of think that co-ops are kind of like an old stuffy type of structure, but actually, co-ops are a really, really fantastic way of democratising ownership. And yeah, we, we, we think they've got a very bright and exciting future, albeit in a very sort of digital way. So, you know, not, you know, village hall meetings. We have webinars that, you know, thousands of people um, can attend. And it's just about, you know, bringing the sort of structure of a, of a co-op into the, um, in, into the digital age. Well, it definitely qualifies for, ooh, I didn't realise that. So... Excellent. Is there a question I haven't asked you that you were expecting me to ask or a topic that you would like to talk about or let the listeners know? No, I don't think so. I think that's, I mean, maybe about when our next project might be. Do tell. So in terms of our next project, we are hoping to be able to um, announce one um, later in the year. So, so the idea is that we will launch one or two per market per year um, and then we sort of build it up across different markets. And yeah, we just have a sort of steady flow of, of, of projects coming. And when you say markets in that context, do you mean the UK or France or Spain, geographic markets? Ge yeah. Geographic markets, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Fantastic. Yeah, Looking forward to hearing all about those in future. Excellent. Uh, Sarah Merrick, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. A couple of takeaways from this discussion. Ripple Energy don't manage the planning or commissioning of any of the renewable energy tech. All they do is act as a go-between to cooperatively fund the project. They pass the energy from that bill via a power purchase agreement to the energy company partners they've worked with at a much reduced price. These savings are passed to the investors. 
Sarah was keen to make sure we know that changes to how the market is priced can be issues for companies looking to plan renewable investments, despite the fact that these changes might be beneficial to end customers of that energy. In particular, decoupling the electricity price from the gas price. Look out for further announcements shortly for new projects in the renewables field. It was great to get Sarah on the show. I've wanted to chat with her for a while. Many thanks for your time, Sarah. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. New research shows that wind farm efficiency can be improved at next to no cost. At the moment, wind turbines are treated as individual units, even if they're part of a large wind farm. But research from MIT indicates that energy output at wind farms can be increased by modelling the wind flow of the entire collection of turbines and optimising the control of individual units accordingly. The changes are small, in the order of 1.2% efficiency improvements, but if applied to the global stock of wind turbines, it will be the equivalent of adding more than 3,600 new units, or enough to power about 3 million homes, and a total gain to power producers of almost a billion dollars per year. That's a lot of hot air, but in the best possible way. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why don't let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musings EV with the words A windy ripple. Hashtag if you know you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know his latest business brainwave is a surefire moneymaker. He's looking at providing mobile donut deliveries on the electric unicycle. All app-based, a fleet of drivers with backpacks, link it in with Dunkin' Donuts and Krispy Kreme. His first market is going to be, obviously, central London. Strange that he's the first, right? See, I just thought, right, let, let's do it. Well, I kind of assumed somebody else was going to do it because it seemed so obvious. Thanks for listening. Bye.